I'm delighted to be joined by Anushka Sharp, who is one of our two Professor Simon and Mrs. Deirdre Gaskell music scholars, is a fantastic cellist and a, a wonderful medical student. Anushka, it's very lovely to be joined by you. Lovely to be here too. Now, we've actually done this um, interview once before. We had to abandon it because you were at Whips Cross Hospital on some cold, very cold, wintry and windswept day. And it was like talking to somebody in some war-torn part of the world with a very dodgy internet connection. Now, what are you doing at the moment at Whips Cross Hospital? So we're on placement. It's our first placement um, as third year medical students. And I, I remember you telling me, because I said, well, this is a very difficult time, isn't it, for students? But you, you pointed out the benefits of the challenges for the health service for students uh, to observe and learn from. Would you like to expand on that a bit? Well, I mean, I think we've been incredibly lucky as students, as medical students compared to other students, because we have, we've had in-person teaching. We've had amazing experiences. So do you think that your, your actual medical experience, your medical learning has benefited through the fact that we've gone through this pan or been going through this pandemic? Well, I have no idea because I don't have the alternative universe minus COVID to compare it to. Mm. But I mean, I do think it's been an amazing placement so far. Now, obviously, the impact uh, on music has been profound. Uh, and it has meant that music making uh, and working together has, in effect, completely stopped. Um, what do you find the beautiful part of making music? Because I know you love chamber music. And why is that so important to you? I think it strikes a perfect balance between you have quite a complex piece to play together. Um, so you can get a huge variety of sound worlds but then it's also small and concise enough that you can really get to the bottom of each line and play a piece of music and know what everyone else is doing. Um, and also playing with other people and working through a piece of music together is very exciting. And during rehearsal, you know, you're discussing everything. Now, one of the things we discussed was um, the issue of being on the conflict of being a musician or a doctor, which I know is something that you've perhaps considered, but you said, if you were to be operated on, you would rather be operated on by a musician who can play in tune. And why did you say that? Well, because you need a very accurate position often to perform operations. If you get something slightly in the wrong place, you might perforate an organ. Um, and I think the closest feeling I've ever had to that is playing cello on stage because one millimeter doesn't sound great. Just Spending a lot of time knowing that you have to get your hands in the right place to the millimetre is a, is a useful skill for both disciplines, I think. Quite right, too. Um, now, music has been a big part of your life. Where did music begin for you? So I started cello when I was four. Um, my whole family are pretty musical. Um, and then I just continued and continued and continued and didn't stop. Um, but it was really nice, actually, just to have it parallel to my academic studies at school. It made a really nice change. I remember it was always like cello and homework were welcome breaks from each other because each made the other seem easier. Because That's one of the things that people say is that um, music provides a, a benefit and as a, well as a contrast to academic learning, uh, often citing that. But do you think that there are specific aspects about music, lear music learning? Uh, and the strategic self-discipline that you need to provide that help with academic uh, progress, progress? Yeah, 100%. I mean, now I'm very aware that probably most of the skills I use come from learning music, be that methodical thinking. So you have a problem, you have to learn how to play something and you have to break it down into its constituent parts. So I have a run that I can't play, for example, in arpeggio and movement three. And... I realise, well, I can't play it because there's a bow movement I can't do. So then I just move my bow and then make a little improvisation with my bow doing that thing. And then building it up, putting it together, translating it into an easier problem, solving that, and then building up. It's very methodical. It's like very scientific. Now, you, you've had some extraordinary opportunities, uh, which... Frankly, music provides uh, much more than, than many other 
uh, forms of uh, educational subject uh, of study that you can do. Um, and I, I want to just bring up or you to guide us through two of these examples. And one was a particular audition that you did to get into an orchestra. Which was this orchestra? And tell us about your audition uh, process. Okay, so I chose this one as my funniest musical experience. Um, so I was, I think, like 11 or 12, because I was auditioning for National Children's Orchestra for the first time ever. And then I arrived at the Purcell School in Bushy and like got to my practice room and unpacked and everything. And then I realised once I got to my practice room, like 20 minutes before my audition, that, that my spike wasn't in my cello case. So it's like the metal pole that actually connects the cello to the ground. So then I was like, well, what am I going to do? First of all, there were no spare cellos. I thought of that one. Um, there was a recycling bin. And then I realised that I could fit my cello in the recycling bin so that it didn't you know, fall down when I was playing it. And then I realised, well, the recycling bin, um, it was great, but it slipped along the carpet so I couldn't actually use it for my audition. So then I found that there was a piano in the room because people play piano. Um, it's a personal school. Of course. And then I realized that if you can get a piano stool and put it in front of the recycling bin, then you can lodge a cello in the recycling bin and it won't slip forwards on the floor because you've got the piano stool there. So then I ended up turning up this audition with my cello and my music and a recycling bin and a piano stool. Um, and then I just played my piece and ended up getting it. So it was quite fun. And you got into the National Children's Orchestra. Well, well done you. I'm sure they'll have been impressed. Um, that's an amusing story, but also musicians often have to perform in very serious settings. Um, tell us about a particular uh, setting that you, you dealt with that I know made a, a personal impact on you. Um, yeah, so I played at a Holocaust mem Memorial event when I was about 14 or 15. Um, and I think that shaped a huge amount of what I know the power of music is because I knew that I was communicating something that I still don't really have the words to communicate. And it was amazing to be able to use music to do that. Um, now, you're going to introduce us to uh, specific works that I know are important to you. Um, but before we look at that, how are you going to include music in your life? Because obviously you've chosen this complicated and very demanding job of uh, medicine in the future, which is going to demand a huge amount of time. How do you plan to uh, keep music in your life? Well, I don't plan to, I think I just will. I mean, first of all, I listen to music all the time, which I really like doing. And then I write music as well. So I'm always like improvising. And I really do hope that I will always play cello and find people to play with. I mean, there's a lot of people in, in medicine in my family, amongst my friends who play music. Um, but I think actually probably the main thing is just listening, listening, listening. It's always, there's always a piece of music in my head, whether I'm singing it to myself or improvising something to myself or just singing a little bit or imagining something, because it, it's just always there. I like to imagine that when I'm listening to different pieces of music, I am doing different things to the extracellular space in my brain. And therefore I'm stimulating myself to think in different ways without actually thinking anything. If I'm revising a uh, part of the day, there's gonna be a bit of music that I wanna listen to, or even within a piece of music, like it's the wrong bit. I'm just waiting for it to get to like, you know, minute 422 of Rachmaninoff four in G minor where there's actually like a really good bit. Like I wanna listen to that bit. Absolutely. Well, Rachmaninoff is one of your first choices, but it's not Rack 4, it's Rack 3. Tell yeah. us why Rack 3 is, or I should not call it Rack 3, as we, we, we commonly do. Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. Why is this work so important to you? I just love listening to it. I think it's an amazing piece because it's got the most beautiful melodies in it that you can just sing to yourself. But the counterpoint is incredible. There's like, I'm listening to it and there's like five different pieces going on. So every time I'm listening to it, I'm listening to something different, which means that it literally never gets boring. Um, and it's, it's such a crazy feeling when you're listening to a tune, but you can hear another tune 
And then you can decide when you're listening, which tune are you singing to yourself? Or are you inventing your own tune to sing over the transport? And it's, I mean, it's just an amazing piece. And also it's very varied. A uh, very fine work indeed. And your second choice is going to be much less familiar, although probably more familiar to cellists. But it's a composer that we don't hear of very much and we should hear more of. Uh, and that's Kabalevsky. Which particular work here? So I've chosen his second cello concerto. Um, partly because when I listened to it for the first time, there was just this one chord progression. And it was so surprising that my, li my mouth literally fell over when I was listening to it. Um, so if you listen to it, I don't know if you the same one. Um, but then also it's got a huge range of energy levels. There's bits where it sounds like Shostakovich. It's so kind of punchy and like vigorous. And then there's some bits where it's so kind of haunting. And I can imagine it'd be so much like amazing to play because the first cello tune is just two Gs. And I can imagine just like driving my bow out along the screen because it's just such an intense note. Um, so yeah, I do very much enjoy listening to that. And I do wish we would hear more Kabalevsky. I think some composers of that period who were rather overlooked in, in favour of composers such as Shostakovich are beginning gradually to emerge, aren't they? Uh, we are hearing more, more of their work. But then is it really who the composer is or is it just the notes? Like if Shostakovich had written that, I'd have still chosen it. Yes, oh, obviously, absolutely. Uh, but he didn't. It was Kavalevsky. Um, now, if your third choice is something completely different, uh, and it's not a piece of music, but we've been talking about the sound of medicine, uh, and you've chosen the sound of ultrasound. But tell me a little bit about your why you've chosen this, and also why you think being able to hear um, results through sound uh, in, in, that we use in, in medicine might be more helpful uh, than is often practiced. Yeah, I did choose the ultrasound machine, inspired by looking at a lot of ultrasound images and thinking, what's going on here? Because it is really weird. And then, well, I mean, it's not a surprise that it's blurry, is it? Because what the probe is doing is hearing something. So I just thought, well, why don't you hear something instead of just like, you know, I don't, you don't see sounds, you hear them. Um, and then I think that one, one thing you said to me as well, people can hear much um, smaller differences in pitch than they can see differences in pixels. Um, and then I guess, obviously, one of the things that you do have to consider is, well, where would it be useful? Because on ultrasound, you can see a plane of pixels, but you can, I mean, you can hear a plane of pixels, you know, you hear, you hear a chord or you hear things coming in at different times, which the probe does again get. Um, but I think one place, okay, so if I was going to choose two places, it would be useful. I think um, it would be when you're inserting a needle and you have to get it in exactly the right place, bang, so that you don't hit any organs on your way in. Um, that would be useful because if you ran, I can imagine this ultrasound probe being like a stethoscope. So instead of hearing the stethoscope, just like a, you know, you hit it and it goes, boom, it's like a massive timpani. But instead, it should be something that fires ultrasound waves, receive them, and then it's a little computer on the way up that translates um, the ultrasound, you know, divides the frequency by like two a lot of times, um, so that you're going down octaves and then you can hear what you should be hearing. Um, so you, you run it along the body, and then when the pitch changes, you know that you can insert the needle. And then also, I think listening to heart sounds, like heart murmurs, because I mean, one of the things that I do struggle with, and I really hope we don't get, get examined on this. You, you're listening to someone's heart and you have to work out whether the sequence of sound is okay. And depending on which valve issue they have, it goes boom, 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 or boom, boom. And it's very hard to tell the difference. But if there was some kind of computer function that mapped the percussion to a pitch, um, so you know, you have the idea that the murmur crescendos, well, why don't you map that to? a glissando going up. Um, you could, if you had that, it would be so much easier to hear, um, unless you were tone deaf. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do, but 
I mean, I think the reason I chose it as a piece of music wasn't so much because it would be medically useful, more because I think that it must sound amazing and very interesting because one of the things that, you know, Schoenberg got so excited about 12 tones, but actually there aren't just 12 tones, are there? There's yeah. zillions of tones. And I mean, why the hell they didn't pick 10 tones and then they could do maths on it? I mean, that's really what they're missing out on. And I think with the ultrasound machine, what you would get, depending on how you mapped something you couldn't hear to something you could hear, you would get a variety of sounds that you hadn't heard before in music. Absolutely right. Yeah. In fact, you're, you're right about your point um, of, uh, I know there is some research being done, and I'm sure other research is being done, about the fact that if you can hear uh, visual results that are done through sound waves, the ear can pick up those uh, differences much more clearly than the eye can. And it's you basically using the senses, isn't it, to a much finer degree and using the senses where they are particularly relevant. Um, that's another issue. So you're probably going to be going into some medical research as well, aren't you, where you can combine your music and your medical interests? I mean, that would be so much fun. Indeed. Well, Anushka, there's always so much to talk about with you. It, it's always a, a real pleasure uh, chatting with you and uh, a, an even greater pleasure listening to you play the cello, which I hope we can do uh, live rather sooner uh, than later. And I think there is now some hope that the, the light at the end of the tunnel is, is emerging uh, with a greater sense of brightness. In the meantime, Anushka, thank you so much. Thank you.